among, among the many extraordinary and incredible things that Oscar said and did in this world, one of the things that he had to say, which I know you'll find of interest, uh, is that only three times in the course of theatrical history had there been a permanent arrangement among an author and composer. And the three cases he cited were Gilbert and Sullivan, Rogers and Hart, and Rogers and Hammerstein. That's a pretty unique concept of collaboration. Uh, yes, I, it's uh, unique enough to be talked about. Uh, I'm in two of these. <laughs> You're the kingpin. And uh, there's a great difference between my two collaborations and Gilbert and Sullivan. In what respect? In this respect. Uh, I got on fine with both my partners. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Gilbert and Sullivan uh, used to correspond, as Oscar and I did, because he lived in Pennsylvania and I live in Connecticut. But uh, this is geographical, it's not emotional, it wasn't professional. Gilbert and Sullivan loathed each other. Well, then I think their output is, is, is doubly significant because they did loathe each other, where you, with both Oscar and, and uh, Larry, uh, had an affinity, different kind of an affinity, to be different, sure. Different, but nevertheless uh, an affinity. We understood each other and uh, worked very cozily together. Well, Dick, one aspect of your collaboration interests me uh, in the respect of Larry really being a, a, a what we would call today a way out character. Larry was anything but what you would call. He was then. He <laughs> was then too. <laughs> yes. Way out. Uh, whereas Oscar was was diametrically opposite. Therefore, in thinking of your association with Larry, you took on the complexion of being a very sane, sober, quiet fellow. Whereas with Oscar, because of his quietude, relatively, you emerged as the dynamo. Therefore, you were the minus in one and the plus in other. I'm speaking electrically here. Uh, I, I think you're on a bad thing here. I don't think this is accurate. Uh, you don't mind my oh, saying please. Uh, my observation. No, with Larry, you see, somebody had to be the weight that kept the, hook, the thing on the ground. Uh, because, as you say, he was way out. He was off on cloud nine half the time. And uh, I had to be the same one. With Oscar, I did not have to be any samer than I am, which is Margaret. Uh, Oscar was extremely sane, very regular, as you point out. And if he said, I'll be there at two, he was there at two, lyric in hand. Uh, I was no more of a dynamo with Oscar than I was with uh, Larry. Except that you appeared to be. Appeared. This is, this is uh, an illusion. Yes. And I would like to go into this illusion because a good deal of it disturbed me. People think I'm a businessman. People thought Larry was a nut, which he was, and Oscar was a poet, which he was. And I was the guy who transacted the business, made the deals, knew how to count. All I can tell you is that this is all a lie. <laughs> well, Oscar himself said that you were the businessman. Well, Oscar didn't tell you the truth. Well, who was the businessman? I've got any number of people in this office who do my business for me. I've got a lawyer whom I can talk to on this. I've got accountants who do all the adding up. I don't know the salary of one person who works for me. Well, Dick, I think it's an achievement to get the reputation of being a good businessman without being one. I don't care for this reputation. I like the reputation of uh, writing good music, if I do. I think it's suspected that you do. Well, this pleases me. Dick, getting back to the collaboration, 43 years of collaboration between uh, uh, Larry and Oscar, which, after all, represents a major part of your life. Now you're without a collaborator. What, what's the feeling now? What, what, what do you plan to do without a collaborator for the first time in all those years? I don't know. Uh, Oscar and I talked about this at great length. This uh, I have not written, nor have I discussed it publicly. Yes. But uh, before Oscar died, we discussed this question. Was he aware? 
the, the last month. And uh, we discussed this thoroughly, because he was wonderful about this the way he was about everything. And uh, he felt that I ought to work with someone young. Interesting. But uh, like his thinking, and pretty, pretty accurate, he said somebody young will give you energy, new ideas, direction, and you will give somebody young experience. Very interesting concept. Now, uh, I thought about this a great deal. And I didn't know whom to turn to. I still don't. Uh, there are tremendous advantages in certain people and disadvantages at the same time. Uh, Oh, a year, a year and a half ago, uh, 20th Century Fox decided they wanted to do a remake of a picture Oscar and I wrote in 1944. Oh, State Fair. State Fair. <laughs> and they wanted new numbers to add to the old score, three songs. And Oscar and I agreed to write them. Uh, then it became obvious that Oscar could never get to the lyrics. And... Uh, I called the studio and told them this. And they said, what do you want to do about it? And I said, I'd like to try the lyrics myself. And I make a deal with you. If I don't like them, you'll never see them. If you see them and you don't like them, I'll tear them up. And we get somebody else. Yesterday, we reached the point of decision because the producer and the author flew on from California and heard the numbers, and they're in. Your lyrics? My lyrics. Was it painful? I never had more fun working in my life. Well, then maybe you've started a whole new road for yourself. Well, I, look, I'm on a new road, whether it's with uh, Joe Dokes as a collaborator or alone. This has got to be a third career, or I've got to die. Well, you're obviously not going to do that. <clears throat> well, I don't intend to. Yeah, we discussed this once before, if I remember. That's right. And uh, it's a, uh, a fork in the road again. Well, you've certainly got precedent, uh, Dick. Certainly not after 43 years of collaboration, but Frank Lesser, Cole Porter, Irving Berlin. That's right. That's right. It's been done. It's been done very successfully. But I think the fact that you say that it was great fun for you to do this the first time in your life is really very significant. Well, uh, it doesn't strike me as being either significant or even peculiar. Why? Because I've enjoyed my work ever since I was a child. I have never had to bleed. You know the expression that writers use. Well, and the fact that the word was around that Oscar used to bleed over a lyric and you dashed off the music That's without right. any difficulty. Uh, this is not entirely true either. Because... <coughs> <coughs> Very often, I've had to go back and do it over again. It doesn't come the minute you sit down and try it. You have to go for a walk or come back the next day. Well, uh, I have a pretty good idea it's going to be there sooner or later. And uh, I've had to work. But uh, I've always loved it. You know, yes, but that was writing music. Or collaborating on yeah, the book in one or two cases. Yes, but this is work and, and it's writing. Yes, it's but, but, but if I may say, uh, composing lyrics is not just work. That reflects talent. Now, had you had any idea that you had this talent before you started it? Just well, I, uh, one point or another, I did an awful lot of lyric writing. Well, that I didn't know. Well, with Larry, I had to. Because Larry wasn't always available. And uh, with Larry, particularly, even when he was available, Larry would not write the word hello unless I was in the room with him. Why? He would disappear. So I had to uh, lock him in, and I had to stimulate him with the tune, and then we would sit there and work out the lyrics. Now, I'm not intimating that I wrote Larry's lyrics. Because only Larry could write those lyrics. <laughs> but I was there for every single word. 
Yes. Almost without exception. You didn't realize that you were serving an in-training period for what apparently you're equipped to do now. Well, uh, I hope. I hope. I don't know. Well, now, apparently it worked well for State Fair that's coming up, Dick. What do you think about future stage productions? I don't know. Interested? Are you going to uh, try it, at least? This will depend on the subject matter. Uh -huh. uh, I think that uh, if I were to do a show for Griffith and Prince, uh, who do a certain type of show, I would like a different lyric writer. Uh, from, different from the man I might ask to work with if Arthur Miller came in with an idea. You see I what see. I mean? In other words, it would be the property that would influence your choice. This is the way I would like to leave it, and this is why I want to do the lyrics for State Fair. Yes, but if I may ask, what, what kind of property would influence you to do your own lyrics? I don't know. Uh, well, I'll tell you what kind. State Fair. All the admiration I have for Fiorello, the musical show, I couldn't write it. The lyrics? Or the, or music. the music. <coughs> this is not in my field, mm -hmm. you see. All right, now that leads me to this, to this question, Dick, about what causes you to choose a particular property that you want to turn into a musical play for the theater? You say that you wouldn't have chosen Fiorello. Actually, you and Oscar didn't choose My Fair Lady, and you had a chance to. We certainly did, and we were right not to do it, and Lerner and Lowe were right to do it. Yeah. But what formula, what, what instinct uh, or impulse did you feel in not wanting to touch Fair Lady? For I can tell you exactly what it is. We would have been too respectful. <laughs> we wouldn't have had the guts to do what Lerner and Lowe did. Are you speaking mainly from the standpoint of theater. lyric? Theater. All right, let me ask you this. Supposing it were Rogers and Hart instead of Rogers and Hammerstein, would that have made any difference? Uh, it's hard to say. We took uh, Shakespeare, you know, and, Boys uh, from Syracuse. and made a musical out of that with no respect whatsoever. Uh, but uh, Dick, are you becoming less uh, uh, or more uh, respectful as you grow older? Oh, no. I didn't think so. Oh, no. When I become respectful, I think I'll be finished. Uh, I think to take Pygmalion and uh, do the Ascot scene, yes. as Lord and Lowe did, took a great deal of courage and willingness to plow, to go right through the basic material and say, this is our version. Oscar and I wouldn't do that, you see. And without doing that, you would have come up with a very dull evening in the theater. Yes. Which there certainly is, was not. You know, a couple of characters. Yeah. And uh, they had the courage to blow the thing up and make a big entertainment out of it. And they were absolutely right. Well, obviously they yes. were right. Going back to State Fair, you indicated why that, that interested you and why you were even interested in doing the lyrics for it. Can you apply your reasons and your interest in State Fair as to how you have chosen other properties to turn into musical plays, you and Oscar? It'd be hard to say, uh, because the properties themselves were so diversified, they didn't resemble each other at all. And I wonder whether that was deliberate on your part or whether that just was circumstantial. No, I think uh, this is almost intuitive. For this reason, if you've done uh, Carousel. I think your next move is to change your diet. Well, you certainly change it. Which is it true of children. You know, you can give a kid as much chocolate as he as he can stuff into him, and the first thing you know, he'll ask for spinach. Maybe. <laughs> no, he will sooner or later. <laughs> but I get your They've point. They've done this. I get your point. So you work on New England. Uh, in the early 1900s, you want to make a shift. Well, you first worked on Oklahoma. That's right. Then and that choice from Oklahoma to uh, changing the Mona story of Lillian to 1890 or 1900 New England, that was deliberate on your part? No, I, as I, I, I must go back to the word I used before. I think it was intuitive. Intuitive. I think you feel the need for a change of diet, and you do something new. 
just as you put on a different kind of tie. Yeah. You know. Well, now you've selected. Let's let's take a, an abstraction here and turn it into a reality. You've selected your property, whatever it is that pleases you or makes you think that this has the elements in it that you want to turn into a musical play. From a craftsman po uh, craftsman's point of view, Dick, what steps do you take to then convert this property, this literary property, into a musical play and get it onto the stage? I know that's a big question. Well, a huge one. Uh, but you, as both producer and composer. Well, this is a long, devious process. Uh, it starts just the way you and I are now talking. Hello, Arnold. Hello, Dick. What do you think? <laughs> and then you sit and you scratch your head for two hours. But uh, you discuss your property endlessly. Oscar and I sat underneath an oak tree of mine up in Fairfield. Literally for months. On what property? Oklahoma. Ah. Before one word was put on paper or one note. So that we knew what the opening would be like. Only like, you yes. see, not content. Uh, this kind of thing. Obviously, uh, a show in the territory about farmers and cowboys would open with a barn dance. What else? Yes. You know, bring on all the kids, you know, have a good time. And it didn't feel right. Felt uncomfortable. We had seen it. We had been there. It uh, wasn't quite good enough. And we kicked us around. It was traditional, time. though. That's right. And that was what was wrong with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we said, well, let's look at the basic play. Green Grow the Lilacs by Lynn Riggs. How did he start? He started with a woman churning butter alone in the middle of the stage. And you heard Curly's voice come nearer and nearer. And he came out on stage, and that's the way the show started. And that's the way we started out. Well, you certainly bucked tradition there, but you've been bucking it all of your professional life anyway, most of it. Well, you see, I think the trouble with so much of writing, whether it's theater, whether it's novels, is the unwillingness be simple. Yeah. The papers are trying to push us into this position where you can't be simple. I got a, a show running now for 14 months to complete capacity. That's about a girl who wants to be a nun and falls in love with a man with seven kids. Well, we're talking about basic things. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the press felt that this wasn't very chic. To Measured be, against what? To be basic. Ah. Uh -huh. Well, boy, the, the day I can't be basic in the way I feel or the way I write, you can come up to the cemetery and see me. <laughs> well, before we get to the cemetery, if I can take you back, I'd like to get into the integration, Dick, uh, a current word these days with different meanings. But the integration, actually, of all of the artistic and creative elements that go into the final production of a musical work preparatory to putting it on stage. Not only you and Oscar, as both producer and composer and lyricist and librettist, but all of the other people. Well, I got carried away. I yes. started with uh, uh, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning in Oklahoma. And the long discussion period of lining the whole show up, what's going to go where, uh, then you try and see the show. Who would design this well? You worry about a designer. Well, in other words, you develop a monitor image, as it were. As far as you possibly can. Of what you want to see. What your idea of perfection. You cast that way. Yes. You say, uh, Mary Pickford, at the age of 16, would be great in this part. Well, you know you're not going to get Mary Pickford at the age of 16. But this gives you a prototype. This is what you would like to have. 
and then you settle for something else. All right, now, in a musical where voice counts for so much, this image that you've created of the character, if the person you, who comes into your view seeming to fit that image has less voice and more dramatic ability, or less dramatic ability and more voice, which way would you be inclined to base your I judgment? couldn't possibly tell you that because I would have to know whom you were talking about. Well, have there been any cases in your memory where you, have, where you have picked out people who had less vocal quality than you might have wanted for your music? Every show. You face it in every show. I face it in every show. Well, with the exception and of... inevitably do it in every show. Well, with the exception of p obvious things, uh, obvious people like Drake, uh, like uh, Larry Douglas, if I can go back to King and I. Sure. John Wraith. In Oklahoma. We've had, uh, had wonderful voices. But we have also had people who couldn't sing. You or Brenner would be the first one to tell you that he can't sing. <laughs> but who picked them? The fellows who wrote the songs. Because they happen to be the producers, too. Well, I got you off track again. Uh, well, no, you didn't really, because this all comes in to talking it out. What are you going to have play the king in The King and I? Muscles. Has to be a tough fella. Actually, you wanted Drake for that part, didn't you, originally? Yes, we talked to Alfred at uh, great length. Uh, he had other ideas, you know, for himself at that time. And uh, we couldn't get together with him. But he was the only one you could envision at that moment, wasn't he, for that part? He was the only one we tried to get. And I don't know if I... I've ever said this, or if, if you know it. Uh, Alfred, Drake, and Oscar and I had lunch together at the plaza when we were trying to cast the King and I. And Alfred, you know, we're still very good friends, said this wasn't right for him at this time, and we agreed. And he went his way with an armful of scripts. And Oscar and I went down to auditions at the Majestic Theater. And Johnny Fernley, who was our casting director, came out on stage and said, you fellas ready? And we said, yes. And out came a fellow with a guitar. And he sat uh, tailor fashion on the floor of the stage. And he hit the guitar, whang, like that, and let out a howl. And Oscar and I looked at each other and said, there he is. <laughs> it was Brenner. <laughs> and he read for us. And uh, this was the next person we talked to after Drake turned his down. Well, there certainly is a case of where you sacrifice vocal quality, assuming you could have had it, uh, for what you felt was flavor right. for the Therefore, part. Therefore, when you get around to writing it, if you know you got Brenner, yeah. you don't hand him some enchanted evening. Because <laughs> you know you're going to get killed. All right, then you wrote for Brenner, actually, didn't you? At that time. And you modified certain That's things. Right. But uh, the whole business of putting on musical shows is the... Uh, the business of modifying. You're always making compromises with everything. But Dick, as a creative individual, I, I know that most creative people, writers, painters, uh, composers, authors, many of them will have a strong feeling of uh, paternalism toward their work. They're in love with what they've written or produced, and they can't let it go. Now, in the musical, a play, a musical comedy field, you must be constantly faced with having to delete things, ultimately, which are very close to your heart. A has it been difficult for you to let certain com oh, compositions of yours go out that you never, have a great love for? Never difficult. Uh, what is difficult for me, terribly difficult, is having anything in a show not reach the audience. Mm -hmm. This is extremely painful to me. I will cut anything. Maybe because, uh, as I said before, I enjoy writing. And it isn't too difficult for me, and I don't bleed. Yes. So this isn't my blood that somebody's taking away. This is just some work I've done. All right, the modification must become the, the, uh, the uh, order of the day in putting together this package called a musical play. Modification and another word, which is equally long, called collaboration. That's what I've got back to, to the thing we you talked about. You have to first. be able to work with people. You must be able to work with the director. 
the scene designer, the costume designer, the usher who takes the people down to their seats. The usher better be nice to the people. This is all part of the theater. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't think that you have to be a sissy yeah. and say whatever you're told is right. You can say, this is a very good tune. Keep your hands off it. But I think that uh, you have to have a very, very strong idea in your head that the other fellow's wrong before you do it. Yes, sir. And you've got to be willing and able to listen to it. Well, now, Dick, all of this indicates a, a, an intense practicality brought to bear on the production of the musical play. But since, well, now, I'll tell you what I'm driving at. Yeah. Since, since you are essentially a creative person as a composer, how do you relate a commonly used term to creativity, like inspiration, to your own particular output? Uh, well, this, again, is not a... Uh a very easy thing. But you've I, I know that you've referred to it as a phony word. In well, its relation to, to... It's phony, I think, less in the uh, content of the, the word than in what the word means to people. I think semantically. Yes. Uh, people don't understand it. Uh, the generally accepted idea of inspiration is something that happens to you right here, and you turn around and you make something out of what happened to you there. I don't think it happened. Uh, there's a common misconception that you can stand on the top of a mountain and look at a sunset and sit down and write something beautiful. I don't think it goes that way. I think that the sunset, the mountain, the experience all go inside and may not come out for 50 years, but they become part of your knowledge, part of your personality, part of your education, part of your technique, and eventually you express yourself. You've had many successes in your life, but certainly none juicier than the success that this song came from, namely Garrett Gaiety's, and the song, of course, being Manhattan. No juicier successes, is that true? Uh, no. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. <laughs> no, I've, I've had juicier successes, if I understand what you mean by the word juicy. Well, this was obviously but, the first uh, big one. Nothing more gratifying. You see, when you're 22 years old, I was then. This is over 10 years ago. At 12, I was going to say. And uh, this thing suddenly drops in your lap after you've been sitting on benches for years. Uh, there's no other feeling like it, of course. And that happened to me with this song and uh, with the Garrick Gaieties. It's just too bad that you didn't have the experience of 59 years at the time you were 22 to appreciate it even more. Uh, I have to tell you something you may not believe. I appreciated it to its fullest. I know exactly what was happening to me. I loved every minute of it. And every time something good has happened to me since then, I've loved it. It's wonderful. It's really wonderful. I roll success around in my mouth like a piece of candy and get the last bit out of it. Success has never come hard to me, as it has to many of my friends. Uh, it hurts some of them to, to be successful. That's very true. You've seen that. Yes, of course. Of course, uh, there are many people who have also been able to enjoy the taste of failure. Well, which, which I you loathe, loathe failure. I love to be successful, and I don't like to be sick. I was going to say, I have the feeling I, I like you, to be well. No, but I was going to say that I have the feeling you regard failure as sickness. No, I think uh, failure is uh, a result of being alive. Well, you haven't had much failure, Dick, and you've oh, certainly yes, been I alive. Have. Yes, I have, Arnold. Well, what failures? Tell me. Uh, you want the list? Well, the 
you want me to go... conspicuous. You want me to go back to Chi Chi? Which is before you were born? Thank you. I think. <laughs> uh, you want to uh, come up as close as pipe dream? Yes, but these are failures in a context. I don't think they're failures in the usual sense. You, you want higher and higher? Which well, ran a hot three months? Yeah, I can take higher and And the higher. star turned out to be a seal? Yes. <laughs> uh, look, I've, I've had it, you know, uh, both ways. And uh, all I can say in my own defense is that I love it when it's good and I hate it when it's bad. <laughs> right? It sounds like you relate to about 99% of the rest of the human race. Well, uh, maybe that's because you're a human being. I would, I would like to think you're right, you know. But, Dick, actually, the success of Garrett Gaieties, I, I'm sure you must have enjoyed it to its full, but principally because you and Larry Hart, Lorenz Hart, your partner, uh, really did buck tradition at that point, because when you consider what the review was at, the, at 1925, at the time of the Garrett Gaieties, you had George White scandals, you had the Ziegfeld follies, uh, uh, the uh, Schubert's musical extravaganzas, all of which bore no resemblance to Gary Gaieties, or I should say the other way around. One exception. There was one little review that did. Shallow. No, no. Shallow was a big show. The Grand Street Follies. <laughs> Our show was not uh, patterned after it at all. But uh, it was the first tiny review on Broadway. The principals were in the chorus. <laughs> this is true. And uh, the chorus kids did the principal song. We had 11 men in the pit, 11 musicians. Uh, the conductor, I wouldn't call gifted, because I was the conductor. <laughs> and uh, the reason I conducted was because I got union minimum for conducting. You know, the same as the, the drummer. And uh, that was more than I got uh, for writing the show. But actually, the success of this is really fantastic looking back, because it really did, for the first time, actually, in the American musical theater, equate the lyricist with the composer. Really the first time. Well, I can explain some of that to you. It was kind of interesting. When I first met Mr. Hart, Mr. Hart was an old man of 23, and I was 16. And uh, he told me his theories of lyric writing. This one Sunday afternoon up at his parents' house, uh, he felt <coughs> that uh, musical shows were cowardly, responded only to formula, and said nothing. And uh, I'm proud of myself that at the age of 16, I knew what he was talking about. I'm amazed. But I did. And I played him some tunes, which he loved. And that was the beginning of a 24-year partnership. Uh, one of the points that he made was the interrelationship of words and music. And uh, I suppose I must have had some feeling for what could be said on the stage musically. Certain words had to be treated in a certain way musically, or else they wouldn't project. This is highly technical. But the fact that at 16 you felt all that, in, in spite of the fact that uh, your influence, as I remember, was essentially Jerome Kern, uh, who really did spearhead a certain move away from the traditional musical comedy theater that we had up to that point. But supposing you hadn't met Larry, do you think the influence of Kern would have just continued you in the general direction of musical comedy composers? Oh, yes. You think it would? Oh, yes. In other words, Larry Hart's concept of rhymes, interior rhymes, etc., is what got you to write the kind of music that would support it? No, I think that I would have written for musical comedy, and pretty much the way I've written ever since, without Larry. Really? Yes. And I'll 
try to explain that, if I may. Uh, I was brought up in a passionately musical family. Unprofessionally musical. Although my mother was a brilliant pianist. She was the best sight reader I ever knew. <laughs> and I'm terrible. I'm very slow. Well, I write everything. Uh, she used to play, and my father, who was a doctor, used to sing while she played. Now, what did she play, and what did he sing? And I think here is your answer. The comic operas of the day. Merry Widow, Spring Maid, Chocolate Soldier. Leha, Strauss, Fennel, oh, right. Romberg. This is what I was weaned on. And these were the happy moments in my childhood. And I turned to this the way you, the way you turned to food. But to turn to that kind of melodic construction, Dick, on the one hand, which apparently was natural in view of your background, and then to come in contact with the sheer brilliance, the offbeat brilliance of Larry Hart's lyrics, must have presented you with some kind of a conflict, even at the age of 16. No, there was no conflict at all. Uh, I think, on what you have to recognize is that uh, in writing for people, there have to be two facets, at least. One is emotional, and the other is intellectual. I think you have to appeal to both. Yes. Both the intellect and the feeling. Uh, Larry was much more intellectual in his work than Oscar. Uh, I don't uh, want to sit here and make believe I'm a great, a great brain. But uh, I think I must have had some intellectual understanding. Uh, before I ever laid eyes on Larry, to be able to work with him. Because he was much brighter than I was. Well, Dick, getting into a specific, uh, one of the earliest things that you and Larry did, and it, it's, uh, I think it's the first or second song in the Rogers and Hart songbook, uh, is a, a song called Any Old Place With You. Uh, uh, in writing this, did you write the music first, or did Larry write the lyrics first? I'll tell you why I ask you after you answer that. If I answer it. If you answer it. Or if you remember. I, well, that's it. I, I'm, I don't know. This is uh, when? Is there a date here? Uh, I think it's uh, copyright is 1919. 1919. Uh, my hunch is that I wrote the music first. All right. Now, if you wrote the music first, this is fascinating to me, because you, mu you, you must have written uh, what you did is the result of your background and, and your training, which was to write in the musical comedy genre, the musical comedy uh, line. Yet these lyrics of Larry's are so completely offbeat today, much less against uh, 1919, sure they are. Uh, where he says, we'll meet in Syria, freeze in Siberia, negligee in Timbuktu. Timbuktu. In dreamy Portugal, I'm going to court you, gal, Ancient Rome, we'll paint anew. Now, this was so foreign to the musical comedy field at that point as to be almost unrelated to it. Well, this is uh, Larry's theory. You know, somewhere, somebody has to take a, a brush and some paint and do something that is going to be startling today. And in 30 years, will be fairly routine, fairly commonplace on canvas. <coughs> You're only talking about a different medium. Well, the thing I'm wondering about is this, in connection with Larry Hart. Did he do this because he wanted to be a buccaneer? Did he want to be way offbeat? Or was this the only way he could do it because that was the talent he had? No. This is the way he was. <clears throat> and this is the way all artists are. The way they are. You can't alter this. You can't change it. And the minute you try to, you have disaster. Larry liked rhyming. Larry liked being brilliant. And did, did he like being brilliant, or was he simply brilliant in spite of whether he liked it or not? He was brilliant. He was also 
deeply sentimental, and in my opinion, I think his best songs were his sentimental ones. And maybe that's because I'm sentimental. But I don't think Larry ever wrote a lyric as good as Where or When. Or My Heart Stood Still. Or My Heart Stood Still. These were his words. They were not intellectual. They weren't clever. There were no rhymes. There was nothing but heart. Incidentally, it's interesting that you say that, because in My Heart Stood Still, in spite of the, uh, uh, policy, uh, the, the multi-syllable form in which he would write many times, the sheer brilliance of his lyrics, My Heart Stood Still has this interesting note here, if you stop to think about it. I took one look at you, that's all I meant to do, and then my heart stood still. Every word, a word of one syllable. Yeah. My feet, my feet could step and walk, my lips could move and talk, and yet my heart stood still. Only words of one syllable. It's almost childish, isn't it? Well, childlike, I would think, rather than childish. This but is you're what right I about mean. that. Yes. This is what I mean. And then on the other hand, when you, when you get back to Manhattan, which was a progression, a five-year progression from any old place with you, you think of the brilliance of these lyrics and the interior rhymes. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of, of two lines such as these. And tell me what street compares with Mott Street in July, which was certainly revolutionary at that point, wasn't it? Oh, sure it was. Well, now, apart from his brilliance and offbeat uh, 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 qualities in writing lyrics, you and Larry really did choose offbeat themes for your productions. Yeah. I'm thinking of Dearest Enemy, which certainly everyone must have poo-pooed at that point as being ideal subject material for musical comedy. Well, you kid, <coughs> uh, kid the American Revolution. You'd Hardly. Trouble. Well, what made you do it, Dick? Because it was fun. It was a very good idea about uh, Mrs. Murray of Murray Hill, uh, which was what the show was about, entertaining the British troops so the American troops could get by. And that was the entire idea of the show. But unthinkable up to that point, as, a, as musical comedy material, I'm sure. Unthinkable, except that Larry and I discussed this for about six years. <laughs> well, and then you went on to, uh, let me see, Peggy Ann, which was no, another... No, no, no. Well, that was later. Something. That was much later. But I'm thinking in terms of offbeat themes. And Peggy Ann was a really offbeat theme, Peggy involving Ann was a dream world. Crazy. Peggy Ann was the first Freudian show that was ever put on the stage. And it was all one long Freudian dream. And at that point, nobody had heard of Freud. <laughs> except <coughs> that we had the word Freud. We had Mr. Dr. Freud in the first Garrick Aides, in a lyric. And which lyric was it? I don't, I don't remember. remember. <coughs> well, then you extended Freud and Peggy Ann. Well, there again, you see, this is uh, what I still feel that my next show, I hope, will be nothing like The Sound of Music. I hope it's as, as big a hit. Yes. Because, <coughs> as I said before, I like this. But I, I want it to be different, because I need the change of pace. I need a different subject matter to attack. Well, it's fortunate that both Larry and later Oscar Hammerstein shared your view about that. Oh, they that. did? In both cases. Both cases. Oh, strongly. Uh, we used to say, Larry and I, uh, that the, the only unsafe thing to do in the theater, the only dangerous thing to do in the theater, was the safe thing. <laughs> so to repeat yourselves. Well, you know, you have a hit uh, about a tennis player. We never did. I just made that up. So you say, well, obviously, the next thing has to be about a football player. <laughs> and then we go on to, uh, to bowling. <laughs> and the first thing you know, you're out of the business. <laughs> this is a good way to sell yourself down the river. Well, now, another theme that really was, I think, uh, somewhat uh, daring at the time was deciding to do I'd Rather Be Right, wherein a president was lampooned in office for the first time in musical comedy history. Yes. This, of course, was not our idea. This is uh, Kaufman and Hart's idea. But, at least, it appealed to we, you knew enough to, we knew enough to say yes when they invited us to write the words and music. Well, it's interesting that you probably laid the groundwork in that for uh, Irving Berlin's lampoon of Truman and Call Me Madam. 
I don't, I don't know where that uh, idea came from. I doubt that it came from our show. Uh, I think uh, Truman was a, a natural for this, this kind of joke. I, I think he had, uh, has enough good humor to like it. Which leads me to a very interesting question, Dick, about the fact that, as far as I know, in the last eight years, no musical comedy has been done which included a caricature of President Eisenhower. I don't think anybody would want a caricature. Well, even if not a caricature, just just uh, in, include him uh, in a uh, include him in the story of a musical comedy. Uh, do you know that it almost happened? In what in what case? Uh, after uh, Oscar and I produced, not wrote but produced, Annie Get Your Gun. We were going to do another show with Irving Berlin, who wrote the music and words for Annie Get Your Gun. <clears throat> and he and Norman Krasner had an idea. I think this has never been told for a musical show. And they came to Oscar and me and asked us if we would like to produce it. They even had a nomination for the leading man. Walter Houston. <laughs> and if you didn't love Walter Houston, you were sick. <laughs> so we said, great, what's the idea? The idea is the war is over. And the biggest general in the United States Army comes home and doesn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> That's delightful. Why Listen, didn't it come about? Well, we got into a, uh, an argument with Irving. <laughs> about terms, methods. It's a purely business technical thing. He thought we were wrong. We thought he was wrong. And we couldn't make it. And I think this could have been ironed out, except for one tragedy, which was Walter Houston's Houston. death. Of course. And so the show was abandoned. But this would have been Eisenhower, <laughs> you see. And I bet he would have loved it. Uh, Continuing on the idea of offbeat themes, uh, I think one of the most interesting of all is what you and Larry did in uh, On Your Toes in incorporating a ballet, Slaughter on 10th Avenue. Now, that certainly must have been greeted with raised eyebrows at the time that you decided to do it. No. Oh, well, very often people have told us we were crazy. Uh, like, how can you uh, base a show on Green Grove the Lilacs? you'd listen to your friends, you never would have had Oklahoma. No, but you and Larry in particular uh, seem to have made a tradition out of not being traditional. I don't even like to have it formularized as much as you just stated. I think you love an idea and you say, I would like to work on this, put it on the stage and let people see. Uh, on your toes. Uh, used ballet in an integrated sense for the first time. The only time ballet had ever been used in the musical theater had been in reviews. A disjointed, yes. disconnected yes. portion of the show. We made it a part of the show for the first time. And uh, we went to a brilliant boy by the name of Balanchine, <laughs> who didn't talk much English but talked an awful lot of ballet. And uh, he loved the idea. Dwight Wyman produced the show. Dwight was a very successful, sensitive, nice man. And he couldn't wait to get this thing into rehearsal. He had no trouble. We showed it to Ray Bolger. They said, gimme. You know, <laughs> he jumped into it with both of those wonderful feet. <laughs> And no, no, we, we had no, uh, no trouble with that. Dick, speaking of trouble, if I may, it's uh, an op very open secret, full knowledge, that uh, life, professional life, as well as friendship with Larry Hart, was not the easiest uh, road anyone could take. No, it wasn't. And you were faced with it for all those years that you... 24. How did you survive it? I know you did, but I wonder how. 
Well, you know, the fact that I'm here is the only proof that I did. Yes. Uh, I wonder how to answer that. Uh, I think you survive very, very difficult things if there's some kind of inner determination to survive. Larry could have ruined me. Because this is a very, very difficult man to, to work with. Sweet. Nicest guy you ever saw. Uh, but you couldn't find him. He would disappear. And there were all sorts of difficulties that uh, aren't particularly helpful to this conversation. Uh, you survive it because of what's good. This is true of many 50-year-old marriages. I should say. They survive because of the good things. I suppose if there are enough bad things in the marriage, it, uh, it dies. Uh, collaboration in the theater, I think, is very much like marriage. Well, I think collaboration is collaboration wherever you practice That's it right. and under what banner. That's right. But it's very much like marriage, with the exception of the one element that we know about. Yes. Uh, you have to give. And with both these men, I don't know why, but uh, with both of them, we established some kind of an Alphonse and Gaston relationship. We'll do it your way. And uh, this is the way it happened with uh, 18 years with Oscar and 24 with Larry. But those 24 years with Larry really must have pulled facets out of you at times, Dick, that you probably didn't know you had. I would think it would have to. Well, I know Larry alerted me to a good deal I didn't know. That's what I mean. Uh, especially as far as theater techniques were concerned. I don't know how he knew them, because they'd never been done. But, uh, Larry, I, I don't know if you know this, had a very interesting family background. He was a great nephew of Heinrich Heine. I didn't know that. Well, he was. The German poet. The German poet. Uh, his parents were German, from Hamburg. And Larry's first work in the theater <coughs> was translating musical plays for the Schubert's. Didn't know that. They paid him, you know, 50 bucks a show or something like that. But Larry, constituted as he was, didn't just make translations of the songs. He made ad adaptations. In other words, he wrote real lyrics, which they used. This is how he cut his teeth. By the time I got to him, when he was this old man of 23, he had had a tremendous amount of experience writing lyrics. I mean, he was my grandfather, you know, me at 16. As you develop, both of you, did the uh, age differential tend to shrink, diminish? Uh, yes, I think uh, towards the end, I had him on my knee. This is uh, not that I grew or he diminished, but uh, he was sicker. And yet, with all the sickness and all the price that you and other friends of yours, I'm sure, had to pay, you really did leave a legacy. Oh, Lord, yes. I should say so. Uh, this may not please some of my good friends, but today, this is... 1961, I suppose. Uh, 18 years after his death, he's the most successful lyric writer in the world. All uh, collaborationists, and at least uh, the dealing with composing and writing of lyrics, create a marriage between words and music. But you and Oscar seem to emphasize a marriage between 
the somatic intent with the musical expression. You started it actually in, uh, in Oklahoma, uh, but I think you continued it in State Fair, particularly with It Might As Well Be Spring. I'm thinking of the, uh, of, of the musical phrase you wrote to accommodate three separate lines. Do you remember uh, here in particular where, uh, where she sings, I'm as jumpy as a puppet on a string? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, uh, this part of it is uh, something you could even call carpentry. Carpentry? Yeah, or plumbing, <laughs> you know, or changing a tire. This is something you should be able to do. If the man says, I'm as jumpy as a puppet on a s string, it shouldn't be very difficult to make your tune go dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum Well, it gives it the impression of jumpiness. That's all. And a slight uneasiness with that last note. That's right. And uh, it's unresolved. And of course, at this point in the play, which happened to be a picture, yeah. the girl was very unresolved in her own mind. All she knew was that she wanted to be in love and didn't even have a fellow to be in love with. <laughs> so you have an unresolved chord to end up your phrase. But this is the interesting thing, Arnold, that in writing these things, you don't go through the thought process that I've just gone through for you. What process do you go through? It's there. Well, how do you mean it's there? That's, that's interesting. Well, you look at the words. I'm as jumpy as a puppet on a string. And you know your music has to be jumpy. You know your girl. And your lover. You never laid eyes on her because she doesn't exist. But you're full of sympathy for her. And uh, you write uh, the end of your phrase that is troubled the way you know she is. Then there were two other phrases in the same song, like a nightingale without a song to sing. Didn't you have the same music to that? Yes, and uh, this is a, uh, a technical situation that you find yourself in. I <coughs> couldn't change the music for that phrase because in the lyrical construction, it balanced mm. the first phrase about the puppet. Yes. So the music had to be the same. You see. But there are other phrases in the same song where this attack. Was well, yeah, she says, I'm as giddy as a baby on a swing. Giddy which is as a baby on a swing. Well, same. it's the same, same thing yes. as the puppet. And you, uh, you state it in the same way musically. Well, then, when she sang like a nightingale without a song to sing, which obviously doesn't imply the same jumpy quality that the other two phrases uh, contain in themselves, then you're counting on the power of semantics to make the bridge. Also, I'm counting on the power of the girl who's going to sing the song. I am counting on uh, the fact that she will know enough to sing this smoothly, mm -hmm. and possibly a little sadly, the nightingale without a song. Yes. And sure enough, that's the way it was done. So it's an interpretive marriage to the semantics of the lyric and the construction of the melodic line. That's right. Now, you get all kinds of marriages in this, a situation like this. The marriage of the fellow who orchestrates it. The marriage with the conductor, who has to know. With the cameraman, who has to know how to photograph the girl at this particular point, <laughs> sitting in the window seat, looking out over the farm. Everybody has to get married. This is what I've said to you before, that the whole business is the most intense collaborative effort in the world, with the possible exception of running a war. Everybody has to fit with everybody else. Well, now, you also transferred the same idea, not transferred it because this uh, preceded uh, State Fair in Oklahoma, when you uh, wrote the music for I'm wait a minute, chicks and ducks and geese that are scurry. Yeah, but this doesn't fulfill itself until you finish the line when I take you home in the Surrey. But when we go out, which is it? The 
place, Dad. When I, uh, when I take you home... When I take you out and stuff. Yes. Uh, the whole idea of the road being flat mm -hmm. and the horse and buggy going along the flat road. You try to say this musically. So you start flat. Bum, 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 bum. Then the trick. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. He made a been a fleck of, uh, of dirt in the road. Yes. You see, in the horse's hoof. This is only interpretation. And this happens in every art, in every expression. You interpret. Well, now I'm thinking again of. Uh the interpretive quality you gave to the music surrounding Bloody Mary in, in uh, South Pacific. The Bally High flavor that, with which you surrounded her. This is my work. No, but I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, fur I'm furthering this thought of Oscar's and yours of the marriage between the semantics and the musical expression. That's right. Uh, this exists. This is constant. This is in everything you do. Now, how much do you miss the power of the word when you begin to let instrumentation, if not orchestration, speak for some of your characters as you did in The King and I? If I remember correctly, The King and, and his interpreter were both silent, and you let a bassoon or a clarinet That's right, both. extend their, their Because thought. they were talking Siamese, yeah. and uh, the audience couldn't understand the language. So I put it in the, in the orchestra pit. Yes. And let... Uh, let these two instruments talk for the characters on the stage. And they simply gestured on the stage. And something that you and I know very well, music being the only universal language we have, this is very simple. The audience always knew what they were saying. <clears throat> Pardon me. The audience then superimposed its own thought. This is where... With your suggestion of music. Well, we, who work with music, have a better break than anybody else. Well, that's from your point of view. Oscar, who worked with words, said that because practically everybody wrote words, that lyrics were much easier. Uh, because so few people composed music, that music represented the great mystery. So apparently, this is a matter of perspective on which side of the fence you sit. Um, I think uh, music is a mystery to most people. And uh, I think largely because it's the one abstract art we have. You can listen to music and make your own interpretation. Of course, the minute you start putting it in conjunction with words, then you've become specific. It can only mean one thing. It can mean the sorry with the fringe on top. <laughs> or it can mean this little girl singing it might as well be spring. Then you become objective instead of subject. Well, now, you just used the word art a moment ago, Dick, and I'd like to discuss a line of your own, that you, which you said to me some time ago, about art, that you defined it as the expression of an emotion by means of a technique. Yes, I was taught that when I was a kid. And uh, I've never heard a better definition one that satisfied me as much, or almost anybody I've ever discussed this with. Because that's all it is. I think you have no art without emotion, and I think you have no art without technique. But put it in the other terms, shall we? Yes. Uh, a fellow driving a truck gets held up in traffic and screams with rage at a taxi driver. He's got an emotion. And that's all he is. Take uh, the fellow who does my income tax. He's as technical as you can get. And uh, very little emotion, I might And add. completely unemotional. Yeah. So there's no art in either case. But if the truck driver could paint and do a good picture of this taxi driver, you might very well come out with art. Yes, but then you're rooting art essentially to the necessity of emotion. That's right. 
Without emotion, all the technique in the world will give you no eye. You see it every time you go into a gallery. You see some fe fella who is purely technical, who does it all exactly right, and you stand there and you look at it, and it does nothing for you. All right, using this, then, as the broad uh, brush to be a to applied to the canvas of the musical theater, as well as any other uh, line of artistic endeavor, since you first began writing with Larry way back in 1919 and 1918, what really significant changes have you seen within the context of this expression of art in the musical theater up to the present? It's been fantastic. Uh, until Showboat, nobody dared deal with essentials in the musical theater. Now, by essentials, what do you mean? You're relating it essentially to story. Yes, story, content, musical content, lyric content, every kind of essential. Uh, nobody would, would have dreamed of going near it. Uh, that happened in 1927. With Chabot. Chabot. Uh From there on, the whole field took enormous strides in dealing with subject matters that had never been touched before. Dick, this was actually a gradual progression going way back. I, I wouldn't know uh, how far back to the days of music halls, where all you had were variety act presentations. Mustn't that be considered the genesis of the evolution of what we call the musical comedy, musical play? Yes, but you're talking about the dramatic shift Oh, yes, it's a the change in yes. approach. And this didn't come until much later. Larry and I tried and uh, in some ways succeeded. You know, we talked about Peggy Ann. Yes. Because this is Freudian in the days when most people had never heard of Freud. And might have served as a forerunner to Lady in the Dark and plays well, the Well, the way it did. Time, yes. uh, Morse's play was much more serious than Peggy Ann. Peggy Ann was done for fun, just for comedy. The Freudian dream for laughs. Mm -hmm. And Morse is very serious about that couch. Yes. Very. <laughs> but Morse couldn't have been serious with his subject matter if John O'Hara hadn't been serious with Pal Jelly. Mm -hmm. You see, all these things progress. One feeds the other. And now, you can say anything in the musical theater that you want it. Well, now, how do you make the distinction, then, according to that line, between the musical comedy and the musical play? I don't make any distinction. I don't know what a comedy is. Comedy is something that has some laughs in it. Well, do you think, on that basis, that everything you and Oscar have done together is a musical comedy? In that sense, yes. Almost. Well, literally all of them had laughs. But uh, some of them were very seriously based, as you know. Well, of course, as we discussed before, the problem of message, or the problem of a theme that you feel strongly about, which is serious. Yeah, but not message. All right, I, I'll, I'll retract the word message, at least from the standpoint of your intent. That wasn't your intent. You know the joke about case. the message? No. It's a very old theater joke. If you want to deliver a message, call Western Union. This has been around for years, and I, I still feel that way. I, uh, anyway. No, but the seriousness of a thing, Dick, through the medium of the motion of, of the of the uh, musical comedy stage, uh, has really become sharper and sharper defined in the past fifteen or twenty years. Oh yes. Whereas you say today you can talk about anything. Well, uh, I would like to see you as the author of a musical comedy. Go up to Flo Ziegfeld and say, I got a great idea, Mr. Ziegfeld, for a musical show. And he says, what, Arnold? And you say, juvenile delinquency and kids murdering each other. Mr. Ziegfeld throws you right out of the window. Now, this is... Uh, the man that I did a couple of shows for, who understood the female body very well. 
And he was great. He had a wonderful eye. But if you had said this to him, he literally would have thrown you through the window. <laughs> now, many years later, a show opens at the Winter Garden, which is about juvenile delinquency and kids killing each other. And it's a smash hit. It goes to London. It's a smash hit. They are making a moving picture of it now. This is how far we've progressed. Then the musical theater, musical comedy theater, if you will, has more and more become not just a means of entertainment as such, but also something of a mirror of our times. Well, this can still be uh, entertainment and entertaining. Yeah, but the two are not mutually exclusive, necessarily. No, of course not. Uh, you can go to see very, very touching, deep plays. Uh, get awfully upset and walk out into 45th Street feeling purged. Well, you feel great because you've been emotionally relieved. You've seen something in the theater that has done something for you. And this is what I think theater should be. But Dick, when you say now that, that in the musical theater you can say anything you please, there's really no stop and no taboo on subject. If that's true, and I'm inclined to agree with you, where do you see the musical theater going in the future? Merely an extension of what it is now, or a continuation? My guess would be that uh, it would be an extension and a continuation. And there might be uh, new elements uh, <coughs> that we don't even know today. That's what I was concerned with, in particular uh, your phrase of pushing the walls back. Well, that's, that's what it is. Uh, you find uh, in the summer theater now, we have theater in the round. This is a mechanical, physical extenuation, extension of the theater as we know it, without the proscenium, with people sitting in back of the actors, and not just the front facing. This is a physical thing that has now been pushed out. Yes. And I think you get this in subject matter. Uh, maybe. Uh, one of these days, somebody will write a show in which the fellow sitting next to you starts to sing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> might be very amusing. <clears throat> Certainly might. Well, since you're a composer, basically, and your essential interest is in composition, de the depiction of, the, uh, of our times in musical terms I know it's close to your heart, and certainly close to your experience in both Victory at Sea and currently Churchill, which is a wholly different commodity to deal with, isn't it, from oh, your yes. collaborative efforts with uh, Larry Hart and Oscar. Uh, I know Victory at Sea wasn't the first purely musical thing you wrote, but it was certainly the first epic, if you can call it that, job that you had to undertake. What were your feelings about it from the standpoint of concept? when this thing was offered to you? Well, I was sitting in this very spot when it was offered to me, and I was scared stiff. How would I come to believe that I had the equipment to tell the story of the Navy in the last war in terms of music? Uh, you must have tremendous belief in yourself, or conceit, or blindness, or be drunk. Or all four. <laughs> uh, and I told the man, I would have to have two weeks to try and work up enough courage to tackle this thing. And two weeks later, after discussing it with my wife, discussing it with Oscar, uh, discussing it with myself endlessly, I decided to take the chance. And uh, I needn't have worried that much if I had only reminded myself of something that I've always known and still do. That if you give the public a melodic line that they understand, you're pretty safe. Yes, but uh, certainly 
covered with, with different appurtenances than you give a, melod uh, a, melod a melodic line rooted solely to musical comedy or the musical theater. Ah, no words, <coughs> but uh, you have pictures. Uh, you may not have the surrey with the fringe on top, but you have a carrier with airplanes on top. Yes. <laughs> and this is what you do. Uh, I wrote a contrapuntal theme for the carriers. And what I did was write a very simple, low-lying melody for the carrier. And the counterpoint for the airplanes, for the airplanes, was staccato and sharp. Mm -hmm. And they, they work together. Yes. This is not very different uh, from taking somebody's words and setting them to music. You're taking a mood, <coughs> uh, content again, you yes. see. Dick, in, in Churchill, you not only had the broad scope to depict of the incident surrounding Mr. Churchill, but you also had the problem of, of depicting a personality, namely Mr. Churchill himself, which you didn't have in Victory at Sea, which I think gives Churchill... No, very little in Victory at Sea. ...which gives Churchill an added dimension. Now, well, these two things so far have pulled you into a different stream from musical comedy that you had been in for all of your life. What do you see now as the extension of both Victory at Sea and Churchill? Exactly what we were talking about before when we talked about the extension of musical comedy content. Uh, that it is possible to say something about Churchill as a man in musical terms a large television public will presumably understand in terms of music. And this is what I tried to do. I've got uh, a very determined, angry Churchill with a cigar standing up like that. And I had to say this musically. I've also got a very pathetic Churchill, worried to death. What's going to happen to England? You know, usually we don't think about Churchill as being worried. But uh, there are shots of him where he was. There was Churchill uh, in his country place. This is, uh, very bucolic. And you say something about Chartwell, where he lived. And that isn't too hard to do if you have any uh, musical sensibility. Can't you say a farm <coughs> without having words? That's all the extension is, Arnold. Now, you knew Churchill personally. You had met him. I met him once. I met him in, in uh, Boston. Uh, when? Uh, when he came to this country, talked in Boston, and then went to Fulton. Oh, he yes, in 46, when he delivered the Iron Curtain, the Iron speech. Curtain speech. Oh, yes. So that must have been Annie Get Your Gut. Yes. Uh, when we were in Boston producing that, we didn't write it. We produced it. And uh, I've always known Bernard Baruch very well because he and my father were classmates in college. And uh, I phoned up and said, Oscar and I would love to meet Mr. Churchill. And they said, be up here at 10 tomorrow morning. And we were. We had Dorothy Hammerstein with us. My Dorothy wasn't in Boston, yeah. so she missed it. But the three of us went up and we met him. And, uh, oh, he couldn't have been cuter. He was just, just wonderful. Very jolly. Had it been helpful to you, do you think, in depicting aspects of his personality? No. Because you had met him? Not at all. You would have gotten enough just from reading about him and enough learning about him? Enough from knowing about him, reading about him, looking at pictures of him. I didn't have to shake hands with him to, to get his quality. Yes. But uh, in depicting the incidents surrounding Churchill, uh, I'm thinking most particularly about the different nations, the di different nationalities involved. How did you handle this problem musically? Uh, oh, 
only in my own terms. Let, uh, let me make this a little more clear. Uh, this question has been asked me many times about the King and I. Yes, it would relate to the King and I and Oriental music uh, and how. Now, music. let's yes. stay, say the King and I and <coughs> leave Churchill for a moment. Uh, what do you do about getting Oriental sounds into the St. James Theatre? <laughs> well, all I can do is try to express these sounds with my musical palette, with what I have to work with. If I tried to recreate actual Siamese music, the whole audience would have been out in the street within 10 minutes. Supposing you were writing for Siamese audiences, that would be different, wouldn't it? I'd, first of all, I'd have to be a Siamese. <laughs> and I may never make it. Uh, you, you've reversed it now. I'm not a Siamese. I'm an American. And uh, if I want to try and paint a picture, too funny the way we keep going back to another medium to express this? Yes. Uh, if you're trying to paint a musical picture of Siam, you do it in your turn. Uh, suppose, let us say, to go back to this analogy again, uh, you sent Grant Wood to Japan. Said, uh, make some pictures of uh, Tokyo. He would come back with pictures of Tokyo. You would recognize Tokyo. You would like it. And you would say, that's Grant Wood. So this was Dick Rogers interpreting Poland, Germany, France, etc. That's et all you can do. That's all you can do. Do it in your terms. 